Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Dry Stock United Church of Christ. We're so glad that you're here to worship with us, whether you're here in person with us or you're tuning in via the computer or the phone system that is now working. All right, a couple of announcements before we begin our time of worship. Uh, I want to highlight that uh, we have some new folks who are serving on our Pastoral Relations Committee. Um, uh, Joy Catherman continues. She's been serving in that capacity. But we've added Bonnie Dodge as well as Jerry Amabile to, to that committee, which supports relations between pastor and congregation. Uh, please look in the newsletter to, uh, to be reacquainted with their responsibilities and why they're, how they're serving uh, the ministries of the church. Uh, but Jerry is the chairperson of that committee currently, but you can check in with any of the three of them if you have any concerns or, or thoughts uh, on, on, on church life. Uh, other announcements. Uh, Harvest Home, we'll try and be, be celebrating that in a few weeks here, but we are inviting you to bring in any canned goods uh, that you would like to offer and to share with our community. Uh, they'll be taken to Haven's Hope, which is uh, out at the Lutheran Church, Four Bells, and we'll be helping to, because that, that um, food bank is really being stretched and utilized by a lot of folks, so we're going to help out our, our near neighbors with, with supporting that ministry there, and we'll be doing that with our Harvest Home November uh, collections, as well as the, the um, Kiwanis in December which normally collects and makes baskets. They will be collecting in December and making, making deliveries to that same ministry. So that's both November and December will be supporting Haven's Hope. So please be generous as you usually are. The Devon House gift collection list was back on the table. I believe Pam um, and along with Carol Snook are, have, have the, uh, the master list with with the gifts that are on that. You can see either Pam or Carol to be a part of that ministry, uh, as well as the Bethany gift list is out, and um, we'll be collecting those by the second week of December, so please uh, get on that, because it's coming fast here. So thank you for all your generosity and support of so many ministries around our area and our region. Uh, I do want to announce that one of our faithful um, listeners to the worship service is uh, Ruth Gelnett. And Ruth has a birthday today, and I'm sure she's tuning in, so I know that she can hear, hear us. But uh, this is Ruth's 90th birthday, and uh, she's related to the Catherine family. She's a part of, a part of, of that, that connection to our church. And we're so grateful for her commitment and dedication to the worship ministries here. Wish you a happy birthday, Ruth, and uh, lift you up on this wonderful, joyous occasion. Any other announcements to share with church family today? It is a beautiful fall day, and hopefully we'll be able to enjoy it as we worship and as we go forth to serve and to, to, uh, to find things to accomplish this day. But let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. And as we, we do that, we begin by singing with our praise group, Here I Am to Worship.
God of our ancestors, we ask that you would be here today as we gather in sincerity and in faithfulness in order to honor you. Attune our hearts to your commandments and your promises as we remember your mighty and your faithful acts. Declare your word to us so that we may be inspired, inspired to live for a purpose, inspired to share the light that you offer. We know that we must dedicate today and every day whether or not we will serve you. We must decide that. Not to decide is to reject you, O oh God. We ask that you would save us from the idols that appear so attractive to us, the toys that, that take so much of our attention and the pursuits that dominate our time instead of our opportunities to serve you. We confess our shortcomings and our failures, and oh Lord, we ask that we may seek a better way, so that we may minister to the needs of others as disciples of your victorious example should. Make your dwelling place with us here, O oh Lord. Reach out and send your spirit among us, we pray. Amen. For our, our time of family time, our time of, of a message for all those of all ages, we're going to talk a little bit about light and dark. Uh, as we'll hear in our gospel message uh, about the, the, the ten bridesmaids and their lamps, some of which were lit, some of which went out. We'll, uh, we'll hear a little bit about that. But I want to talk about what light and darkness kind of mean or kind of uh, how we think about them. Uh, once, probably a few years ago, I heard the idea that some people add light to a room when they enter, and some folks take light out of a room when they enter. And to think about that is, is that you know some folks add to the to the to the light to the to the good things that are going on. Some other people take the wind out of the sails as they come around. Who can remember the Debbie Downer on Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live? Who, no matter the conversation, no matter where it's headed or what's being said, whenever Debbie says something, everything's over. The whole, con whole conversation is dead and causes everyone to lose their train of thought and their, their reason for it whatever they were talking about. We have to remember that we are called to share light. We're called to, to be light, and to add light wherever we're at. And we can do that in a number of ways. It can be by encouraging someone else around us, by checking in with someone when we, we see that they're not having such a good day or that they're struggling with something. It can be a check-in or saying, hey, I'm thinking of you or lifting you up this week. I know you're going through some difficult stuff, but you're not alone. That's what we are as the community and the body of Christ as the church. We add light to the lives of one another and to, to the lives of the communities that we live and serve. So as you hear this gospel message uh, about light and about lamps, Think about the ways that you are active. Think about the ways you can be active in adding light to your family, your friends, to your neighbors near and far. That's our prayer and our thought for the day for the people of God in all ages and times. Now we're going to hear the word of Scripture from our Joshua passage, thanks to Don Bowman. So listen to the word of the Lord. Good morning. Hear the word of God in our Old Testament scripture reading from the 24th chapter of Joshua, beginning with the first verse and concluding with the third, then picking up with the 14th verse and concluding with the 24th. 
Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, leaders, judges, and officials of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. Joshua said to all of the people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago, your forefathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the river and worshipped other gods. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the river and led him throughout Canaan and gave him many descendants. Now, fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord of our God himself who brought us and our fathers out, out of Egypt and from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites, who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Joshua said to the people, You are not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. But the Lord said to Joshua, No, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses, they replied. Now then, said Joshua, Throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, We will serve the Lord and our God and obey him. Here ends the Old Testament reading. May God add his blessing to my reading and your hearing of his word. Thank you, Don. Next, we're going to hear our special music, which will be coming to us from Valerie here this morning. We're so grateful to have her gifts and her willingness to sing with us. And thank you, Theo, for accompanying her.
very much. Our gospel lesson comes from the Gospel of Matthew, from the 25th chapter, reading the first 13 verses. Now, this is going to be a little different than my normal gospel lesson reading. This is actually going to be a, a monologue with, with some, actually it's, it's, a, it's a, me reading the scripture passage. But there will be some internal dialogue uh, type things coming forth from some voices. Uh, kind of like, you know, as you read something, other things start to pop into your head. And that's kind of what's going on here. The other voices that you'll hear are the thoughts that go through the mind, possibly when you read this scripture passage. Here we have the ten bridesmaids, five of which have their life remained lit, and five run out of oil. Let's listen for the word of the Lord. Now at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. But if you think that you are wise in this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. In the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus came to his disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So, could you not stay awake with me one hour? At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom! Come out to meet him. Then all of the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both us and you. Give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. Instead, go to those who, who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. In the city of God, they will not need the light of a lamp, for the Lord God will give them light. And the virgins who were ready went, went in with him to the wedding banquet. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. And then the door was shut. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. Later, the others also came to the door saying, Sir, sir, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth. I do not know you. If a man shuts his ears to the cry of the poor, he too will cry out and not be answered. Here ends our first gospel reading for this day. Uh, that that was set up there on this this chapter 25 of, of Matthew's gospel was put together by by David Roberts. I found it on uh, the Pathos website this week as I was preparing and wanted to, to share that with you. And I'm going to continue to share my message uh, with some of the thoughts of, of David as well, woven in to this sermon at this time. Now, for most of my life, I have identified with those five virgins or bridesmaids always seeking to have enough good stuff in my land. You know, the good works and faith so that one could persevere in, in the dark, in the darkness of a, a sinful world which 
we believe we find ourselves in. Now, to always be prepared or to do my best was, was the goal, to take, to take those lines and those mottos from the Boy Scouts and Cub Scouts. But that was the way I set out to live, and many of you may be the same. Now, I envision myself as one of those wise bridesmaids, holding on to my lamp in that dead of night, but my, my sympathies changed as I, too, had times of spiraling into deep doubt. But certainly, those times came and went, some lasted longer than others, but finding myself in tune with how those other five felt. Suddenly, I found myself as one of those foolish ones, watching the light of the lamp evaporate into a thin puff of smoke, and finding myself quite jealous of, of those whose faith was still burning bright in the darkness. So I was foolish, begging, hoping, praying that my lamp would not die, couldn't conjure up more faith or, or light in my life. The foolish bridesmaids could, could, could not conjure up the needed oil in the dead of night without leaving that place. So I began to ask, as I read this passage, what mistake did those foolish, foolish virgins or bridesmaids make? What made them so foolish? in the eyes of this storyteller. Everyone fell asleep. Even the wise fell asleep when they should have kept awake. Surely they cannot be faulted for not being watchful enough as the story's closing admonition indicates. And as the bridegroom, not the bridal party, it's not the bridal party who, who broke the protocol of of arriving on time. The bridegroom is late into the night for the banquet. Surely they cannot be shut out just for being late to the banquet, as we see the bridegroom being just as late or just as at fault. But what would have happened? I wonder what would have happened had the bridesmaids simply continued to wait with their sputtering lamps that were going out, that were dwindling, just as their oil ran out. What would have happened had they just simply waited in the darkness of the night with the five others who had light? To me, maybe this is their mistake. They left when they should have stayed. Now, the bridal couple surely would have welcomed their friends into the light of the banquet, unconcerned about the state of their lamps, happy just to, to see their friends waiting for them so they could celebrate together. What faith it would have taken, though, to wait in such frailty, in such a state of vulnerability, offering the honesty of oneself. So no matter how thin our light, no matter how dark the night, we wait. Not seeking to be anything other than present, right here and right now, where we are and as who we are. We trust that in the, the end, when the light of the bridegroom arrives, it won't matter whether our tiny oil lamps are flickering still or are extinguished completely. Rather, the light of the one that we wait for, the one that we wait for will be enough for us all in order to illuminate the beauty of the darkness and to, to bring us to the joy of that midnight celebration. But there's more here that bothers me about this parable. What are we to do with those wise ones who couldn't spare some of their oil? 
Those wise ones who choose their needs over the needs of others. What are we to do with that? Truly, I can think of nowhere else in the Bible that we have afforded such selfish behavior and exalted it. No, they say we cannot share with you because we might not have enough for ourselves. We're not sure. But just to be safe, we're not sharing what we have. The idea of scarcity is not one of faith or of hope. Why is it rewarded? No one has ever become poor by giving. The wise and the foolish, it seems, operate on that same premise of scarcity and fear. Neither of them trusts the love that the bridegroom has for his friends. Neither trusts that the, the bridegroom will embrace all, regardless of whether they walk in the light or they walk in the darkness. Neither remembers the words of the psalmist who, who reassures us that to God, night and day are the same. The night is as bright as the noonday sun to God. So the wise break up the bridal party and send the foolish away in order to beg and to, to bang on doors of, of friends, relatives, shopkeepers, in search of oil at midnight. Now, by the time those foolish ones get back, they're, they're ostracized, they're left out in the cold and in the dark of the night. Surely, the, the groom thought them to be derelict friends who, who couldn't wait up with them for just a few hours. Perhaps he thought they had simply just given up and gone home during that long delay, but they had not. They returned. Nothing could have been further from the truth that they would not return. They, they bear no great sin compared to the others. They wanted to please the groom so much that they went to the next level of effort. They showed up, and then they went forth to, to get what they were in need of in order to join the festivities. Yet, traditionally, traditional thought takes on this passage continue to praise behavior that runs counter to the central themes that we see throughout Jesus' teachings and the gospel message of radical inclusivity and compassion at all times. We celebrate or, or idolize the wise ones the haves who refuse to share with the have-nots. We celebrate the wise ones who are responsible for the others who are left out in the cold. And then, what are we to do with this bridegroom, who is, who is the apparent Christ-like figure, who acts so uncharitably, and who tells these others who do not get in, he tells them to go away. He does not know them. Is this the same Jesus? The shepherd who leaves the 99 in order to, to search and to find the one who is lost? Is this the same figure who leaves no stone unturned in order to find the lost coin? The word no. According to the customs of that first century time period of Matthew's Gospel, the groom would have arrived to the wedding celebration with the bride, not as this text seems to, to apply to get the bride. The bridesmaids would have been the bride's friends, and they would have been waiting her return with the groom. Indeed, many scholars agree that the original parable likely included the bride and 
the bridegroom arriving late together. However, that wouldn't, that wouldn't work. That would contradict the understanding uh, of the story and the purpose of the story traditionally. But if the bridegroom is already with his bride when he arrives, then how can this parable be interpreted as the return of Christ to take those with him? It can't, because this parable isn't about the return of Christ, as we have thought many times. This story is instructive and important. As you read the story, it's instru instructive and important to remember that Matthew's gospel was written shortly after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, about the year 70 AD, at a time when the Jewish leadership were understandably licking their wounds because of the destruction of their holy place, and they were trying to retrench and rebuild their community of faith and religion. They were clamping down on these rebellious groups these heretical strands of Judaism. And one of those strands was, of course, the Jesus movement. So they were, of course, shutting out those who were following Jesus. They were drawing lines of, and sections of who was in and who was out. In other words, this is a story about real life. This is a story about religious leaders who were literally shutting the doors of the synagogue to those who follow Jesus. Now when Jesus gets to the end of his Kingdom of Heaven series here in the book of Matthew, we have the story about the ten bridesmaids. We have the story about the talents that are given and shared, you know, the different amounts, the one, the three, the five, the ten that are given out. And there's the story, of course, about the sheep and the goats who are sorted because of their deeds, because of the lack thereof. Jesus informs his, the gospel writer here informs his listeners who were truly foolish and who were truly wise in each of the parables. Friends, in the end, Jesus says, those on their way to heaven will be decided by what they gave away. Whether they fed the poor, whether they welcomed the stranger, whether they clothed the naked, whether they visited the sick or the imprisoned, whether they shared what they had, whether they shared their oil. If they hoarded what they had, then they, of course, already enjoyed their reward. It was comforting, of course, but it was temporary. The wise on earth had their wedding feast, while they were there. But that is not how it will be in the kingdom of heaven. I could go on and on about this parable. It's one that sticks with me, of course, because it is tough to understand. Because more than, and also because more than anywhere else in Holy Scriptures, I find myself in this story. And I guess more than any other story, it's because it turns out that I, I have probably been each and every character in this parable. And you probably have too. I've been the foolish one whose lamp runs out. I've been the wise one prepared and afraid to share and afraid of losing what I had. I've been the bridegroom who refused to let others in. And maybe in the end, that's what this parable does for us. Maybe that's what all good short stories do. They allow us to find ourselves with our warts, our bumps, and our imperfections, and still find that we belong. So if you find yourself feeling like the foolish bridesmaid, remember to wait, to wait in that struggle and in that darkness. Don't run from it. It's a holy place, and God will meet you there. So if you find yourself feeling like one of the wise bridesmaids, remember to 
to share what you have, even if it scares you to think that you might not have enough. Don't trade temporary comfort for lasting and beloved community with others. The chance to give of yourself is also a holy place, and God will meet you there as well. And so if you find yourself feeling like the bridegroom, remember to open wide the door to the banquet feast. Don't let hurt feelings or fear insulate you from others. Welcome those who have made mistakes. Welcome those who, who walk in darkness in that holy place. For God will meet you there as well. It's been a long anticipated week that has made half of the country happy and made half of the country upset. But remember that these are temporary comforts or joys or temporary disappointments. And remind us of our need and our call to work for the good of one another and the good of the community that builds and gives to those who are in need and who ask and who we seek to connect with. May we seek to, to find one another where we are at and to go together into an eternal future of hope, of healing, and of compassion. Maybe so in your life and in mine. Amen. We come to the point of our service where we lift one another up who find themselves in the difficult times. We remember them, we name them aloud, and take them with us in order to pray for them uh, as our week continues, in order for us to, to possibly find ways of offering support and care and compassion. So we lift up many who are, are listed in our bulletin. Um, we lift up Ronnie, Ronnie Caster, who's now in the Hershey Hospital, um, getting some strength back, receiving some treatments. But we continue to lift him up as well as, as Ryan and, and the whole family in this time. We continue to lift up others like Pat and Mabel June um, and Bob and Dolores, who are, are in different settings um, and different points of, of healing and health. And make sure that we know that they are, they are remembered by this community, loved and, and treasured. And we lift up many others, like Bob Reedy and his family. Are there others that you would like to, to, to name aloud or to have us share in prayer today? Certainly, God hears all, all prayers and all concerns that we lift up aloud or silently. So let's go to God in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we come to you at all points of life. We are grateful for the opportunity to gather here in person, as well as we are grateful for those who are able to take time out of their their days, whether it be now or later in the week, to connect with this community of faith. We lift up so many who, who are in need of what you offer, O oh God, whether it be physical nourishment, emotional or spiritual connection. We know that you are here to offer faithfulness, and we give thanks. We lift up the needs of one another, the struggles, the concerns. We lift up the needs of our world, which are, are many, whether it be storms of life, whether it be disappointment or fear of not having enough. We know that we can come to you, O oh God. Help us to be, to be wise and faithful in your ways, O oh Lord. Help us to trust even when it's not easy to do so. May we remember that 
we have been in, in the situations that others find themselves. And may we have compassion and may we meet those in those needs. May we share opportunity, may we build relationships and community together. Well, Lord, you have shown us how to do so. You have shown us what it means to, to care for and, and love and to give, even when it's difficult, even when it's your whole self as you gave yourself on the cross for us. As we go forth into this week, may we feel the strength, the warmth, the encouragement that your spirit gives us. May we trust and know that you are near, that even in the darkness, your light shines through. As we go forth, may we take with us the way that you taught us to pray together by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we bring our worship here today to a close, let us join together in singing and proclaiming the blessed assurance that we have felt or that is possible in our Savior. Let us sing together.
light, whether uh, we have tons of oil, and whether it has, it has extinguished and we've run low. May you go forth to remember that all places are holy. All people are holy. Everything we encounter has God in it, so it is holy. So may we act, share, and live like the people of God. For that is what Christ has done on our behalf and calls us to his well. May we be of good courage. May we hold fast to that which is good, rendering no one evil for evil, but strengthening the faint-hearted, supporting the weak, helping the afflicted. May we go forth to love and serve God, always rejoicing in the powerful presence of the Holy Spirit this day and forevermore. Amen. Well, I hear my friends are ready to shake their let us sing our closing song together. Mm -hmm.